Momentum is mass times velocity, and light has zero mass. So we would expect its momentum to be zero, but that's wrong. Light happens to have a momentum, and its value is E, the energy of the light, divided by C, its speed. And I always wondered, how did that make any sense? I looked up online and I did find some derivation. My idea was if I can understand, if I can look at the math, maybe I can understand the physics. Boy, was I wrong. The, their derivation starts by saying, hey, remember Einstein's equation equals mc squared? And I'm like, yes, I remember this. Okay, this is interesting. Then it goes on to say, hey, E equals mc squared is not the complete equation. Instead, this is the complete Einstein's equation. And then it says, you know what? Since light has zero mass, just substitute mass equal to zero, and look what we get. We get E squared equals pc the whole square, and the squares cancel out, giving you p equals e over c. Ta-da! Yeah, that doesn't explain anything. So I thought I would never be able to understand where light's momentum comes from, where that equation truly comes from. Until I met Feynman. That's right, Feynman blew my mind away. And so by the end of this video, we will have a much deeper insight of why light has momentum even though it has no mass. And we'll be able to use that insight to actually derive that equation much more logically, but more importantly, all by using high school electromagnetism. So if you're ready for this, let's begin. So where do we start? Well, we start by asking Feynman, Feynman, why does light have momentum even though it has zero mass? And Feynman asks back, Mahesh, why are you so bothered about the fact that something can have momentum even though it doesn't have mass? And I tell Feynman, well, because momentum equals mass times velocity. If you don't have mass, you won't have momentum. And Feynman responds and says, ah, I see the problem. The problem is, Mahesh, this is an approximate formula that only works for a very special case when things are moving much slower than the speed of light. How can you use something like that, something so special and generalize it and say that that's what momentum is? You see what Feynman is saying? It's kind of like being stuck on an island that only has brown dogs and then thinking that dogs need to be brown in color. In fact, an animal is only a dog if it is brown in color. You see the problem with that, right? It's only that we have been exposed to brown dogs, but in reality, dogs have nothing to do with being brown. You can have a white dog, you can have any color dog. Similarly over here, just because we're exposed to things that have mass and have momentum, we think that you need to have mass in order to have momentum, which need not be the case, is the point that Feynman is making. And so, where do we go from here? Well, I think we need to take a step back and ask a much bigger question. Feynman, what is momentum exactly? And Feynman says, that's an excellent question. That's an excellent place to start, Mahesh. So Feynman says, well, momentum is the ability to push something and make it move. Anything that can push something and make it, make it move has momentum. So if something can push a lot and make it move a lot, it has a lot of momentum. And if something can push a little bit, and make it move a little bit. It has a little bit of momentum. So let's use this as our definition and then see if light has momentum or not. So now the question we need to answer is, does light have the ability to push on things and making it move? Well, my first answer is Feynman, no, because light is literally falling on me right now and it's not pushing me at all. But Feynman reminds us, Mahesh, maybe light has very tiny momentum and we just can't feel it. So which means we need to either do much more delicate experiments or we need to find a source of light, we can find a very, very powerful source of light. Luckily, we do have a very powerful source of light, the sun. And turns out there is something that we can see outside and check whether light has momentum or not. Comets, now I would expect that if a comet is moving this way, its tail would be trailing behind it like this. But when we look at the comet's tail, it turns out to be somewhat like this, not trailing behind. It feels like it's been blasted away from the sun. What could be making it do that? We think it's the light from the sun that's actually blasting it away. 
look right in front of your eyes as an example of where light has the ability to push on things and make it move. And just to be sure, we have now done more careful experiments in our lab where we have shined laser on extremely thin metallic foils on a v almost frictionless surfaces and we have found that light can actually push things. Search for light sails and you will see a lot of those examples. So the evidence is right in front of us. Light has the ability to push things and make them move and therefore light has momentum. But if you're like me, you still have the mass issue, still not satisfied. Maybe we can rephrase the question like this. Feynman, for normal day-to-day -day objects, it's their mass that gives them the ability to hit things and push on them and make it move. So it's their mass that gives them their momentum, right? Similarly, when it comes to light, what is it about the light that gives them the ability to push on things and make them move? What about light gives it its momentum? I think that's a good question. And Weinman says, that's an excellent question, Mahesh. In fact, the answer is going to surprise us, is what he says. And I am intrigued because Feynman never fails to deliver. So let's go, Feynman. What's the answer? What makes light have momentum? Feynman says, consider an electromagnetic wave traveling to the right. We probably already know it has oscillating electric and magnetic fields which are perpendicular to each other and to the direction of light. Over here, I've shown electric field in the vertical plane and the magnetic field over here is in the horizontal plane. Now Feynman says, Consider it is being incident on say a thin foil, okay? Now if you imagine a tiny electron in it, that electromagnetic field falls on that electron. For now, let's just focus on the electric field. What's going to happen due to the electric field? Well, charged particles experience a force due to the electric field. Now since electron is negatively charged, it's going to experience a force in the opposite direction of the electric field. And at this point, I'm gonna interrupt Feynman and say, I think I get it. This is where light's momentum comes from. Look, the electric field is able to push on that electron and make it move, and therefore it's transferring momentum to the electron. That's where the momentum of light comes from. But as I say this, I think that doesn't make sense. Here's the reason why. Well, right now, notice uh, the electron is being pushed up and therefore the electron will start moving up. But a little later in time, the electron will be pushed down. And so the electron will move down which means on a large enough time interval, I will, it'll just make the electron go back and forth. That's not delivering a net momentum. That's not delivering anything. On the net momentum it delivers is zero. So electric field is clearly not delivering the momentum. Feynman, what are you talking about? And Feynman says, yes, Mahesh, you're right. It's not the electric field that delivers the momentum. You interrupted me. It's, it, it's in fact the magnetic field. It's the magnetic field that's responsible for delivering momentum, for light having momentum. And I am like, well, how? I mean, even magnetic field flips back and forth. So even its force will also flip, right? And this is where Feynman reminds us to use our high school electromagnetism. So let's look at the magnetic force a little bit more carefully. If you have a charge that's moving, let's say upwards, and let's say the magnetic field is coming out of the screen, and this is a positive charge, then that magnetic field is going to put a force on this charge. Remember, magnetic fields only put a force on moving charges. And the expression for this force is given by what we call the Lorentz law. Now at this point you may be thinking, Mahesh, you just bought in a random equation. That's not a random equation. That's the equation from high school mag uh, electromagnetism. Just like how electric fields put a force QE, magnetic fields put a force Q, V cross B, because velocity matters. And for us right now, what's important is the direction of the force. And the direction of this magnetic force is given by V cross B. How do you find that? So the way you do that is you use your right hand, you, you, you put your four fingers of the right hand in the direction of the velocity. Now over here it's up, so you start by pushing it up. And then, since you are crossing from V to B, you curl your fingers towards B. Now over here, since the B is coming out of the screen, you curl your fingers towards coming out of the screen and the thumb points to the direction of the magnetic force. Notice over here, the thumb is pointing to the right and therefore the magnetic force over here will be to the right. 
This is how you find the magnetic force direction. And of course, if that's a negative charge, like in our case, then the force would be in the opposite direction. All right, so let's apply this and see what is the direction of the force, magnetic force acting on the electron over here. So to do that, let's zoom in a little bit. Let's start with the first one. Over here, again, the velocity is upwards, but this time the magnetic field is in to the page. And therefore, we orient our right hand this way. Look, velocity is upwards. And now since the magnetic field is into the page, we will curl inside, and look, the thumb points to the left. But since it's the electron, it's a negatively charged particle, the magnetic force will be to the right. And this is interesting because now we are getting the force in the direction of the electromagnetic wave, in the direction in which the light is moving. So that's the direction of the force right now. But what's gonna happen next when the field flips? That's the moment of truth for us. All right, here we go. Now the velocity is downwards, and therefore we start with our hand, with our forefingers pointing downwards. And since the magnetic field now is coming out of the screen, we prepare to curl our fingers coming out of the screen and look at the thumb, it again points inwards. That means the electron, since it's a negative charge, will again experience a force to the right. This means in both the cases, the electron is being pushed to the right. The magnetic field in this case will always push the electron to the right. And since all the electrons of that material is going to get pushed to the right, all these forces will add up and now that material will get a net force. And that material will move, transferring momentum to it. And so you see right in front of your eyes, what causes momentum? What makes light have momentum? It's its magnetic field. Wow. This is amazing. I find this amazing because usually when we learn about electromagnetic waves, if you have done that, we mostly ignore the magnetic fields. We always talk about its electric fields, whether you're learning interference or polarization or anything else. But right in front of us over here, magnetic field is always, always ignored. But here, magnetic fields makes a comeback. It's the magnetic field that gives light its momentum. Who would have thought it was there right in front of our eyes? I don't know about you, but I was pleasantly surprised when I learned about this for the first time. All right, we're not done yet. We have one last thing to do. If this is indeed correct, the, we need to follow that rabbit hole and ask ourselves, can we actually get to the equation from this? Feynman, can we derive it? And Feynman says, yes, Mohesh, we can actually go down the rabbit hole, see where it leads us, and actually see what the equation is for the light's momentum. And so if you're ready for it, let's do this. Let's do the last part and let's see if we can derive it. Where do we start Feynman? Well, Feynman says, start with the magnetic force. That's the one that's delivering the momentum, right? So what the magnetic force over here is just going to be Q times V into B, the strength of the magnetic force, the magnitude. Well, and the reason for that is because when you do a cross product, you actually have a sign of the angle between the two. But so since over here they're perpendicular, look, velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field, the angle is 90 degrees, sine 90 is one. In simple terms, when V and B are perpendicular to each other, this cross product just becomes V times B. So the magnetic force right now is Q, B into V. E. But what is the magnetic field strength of an electromagnetic wave? It turns out that the magnetic field strength and the electric field strength, they have a very nice relationship for any electromagnetic wave. They always follow this relationship, this rule, that the magnetic field should always be the strength of the electric field divided by C. And again, at this point, you might say, Mahesh, you brought in a random equation. And Feynman reminds us that's not a random equation. Again, that comes from high school electromagnetism. When you apply Maxwell's equations to electromagnetic waves, that is a relationship that you get out of it. But more importantly, it makes sense to me. All, all it's saying is that electric and magnetic fields have some kind of a relationship with them. And that makes sense. Just like how they're perpendicular to each other, they have to be. This is another condition that they have to be. Magnetic field should always be electric field strength divided by the speed of light. And if you look at this equation carefully, you see we have QE. QE 
is basically the strength of the electric force acting on the electron. Which means if you simplify this, we basically get the magnetic force equals the electric force into V divided by C. And I'd like to pause at this moment because this is such a beautiful equation. It's telling me a lot of things about that. First of all, you can see both the magnetic and the electric force acting on this object in one single equation. That's nice. But secondly, we can also see why magnetic force is so much smaller than the electric force because of this huge denominator over here. It comes from this equation. And that's one of the reasons why in electromagnetic waves, magnetic forces are usually ignored because their effects are much more tiny compared to the electric force. Yet, when it comes to momentum, magnetic field makes a comeback. Anyways, we have a derivation to make. So where do we go from here, Feynman? Feynman now asks us to look at the numerator much more carefully. And what do we see? Well, remember what force into distance is? Force into distance is basically work done. It is a measure of how much energy is transferred into a body. So when I push on something, I'm transferring energy into it. And force into distance is a measure of how much energy I transfer. Well, what happens if I divide by time? If I consider this per second? Well, distance per second is velocity. So this is force into velocity. And so force into velocity is basically work done per second, which is in other words, energy that I'm transferring into an object per second. So when I'm pushing something, um, if I multiply my force and the velocity due to my force on that object, I get how much energy I'm transferring every second. And look, that's what this is. This number is basically the energy that the electric field is transferring into that electron per second. And so that's what we get. And finally, how do we go from here to momentum? Well, we remind ourselves, well, what is force? You might know force is rate of change of momentum. In other words, force is a measure of how quickly you're transferring momentum. Momentum transfer per second. And so look what we've actually derived. We've now derived the momentum that the light transfers per second is the same as the energy that it transfers per second divided by C, the speed of light. And if you cancel out the seconds, you get your equation, P equals E divided by C. Boom, there we go. Feynman has delivered. But what I find so much more intriguing about this is that I not only have derived it, but I understand the intricacies of it. For example, I understand that who is delivering energy into that electron? It's the electric field that's doing that. Uh, it's doing that. It is the one that's giving the energy to the electron, kicking that electron and giving it a speed. But once the electron starts moving, magnetic field kicks in and that starts pushing it, giving it the momentum. That's the kind of intricacy I never got from any other derivation. So not only have we seen why light has momentum because of its magnetic field, we've also derived it in a much more logical fashion. And the hope is that this has put to rest all the lingering questions that we've had about light and momentum and where the equation comes from. I've had an amazing time learning and making a video on this and I hope you did too. By the way, before you go, I plan to make a, a few more videos on quantum mechanics, relativity, and all the fun stuff, but just by using high school physics and giving a deep physical intuition. If that's the kind of stuff you dig, please subscribe and show your love because I want to see if this works. I want to continue doing a lot more videos on it. Yeah, that's about it. Bye.